the big question, what do the C and sweet tea have in common? Sketches and Secrets The sun looked like an angry red ball on the horizon when Amy got up. It was going to be another scorching hot day. Tess had put out boxes of different kinds of cereal on the table, along with fresh and dried fruits and nuts. Amy sprinkled a few blueberries on her wheat flakes. Could you pass those, please? Felix asked. Amy did, and then stared as Felix dumped a handful of blueberries on top of all of the things he had already heaped onto his cereal. Raisins, sliced bananas, almonds, dried cranberries, peanuts, grapes, and flakes of dried coconut. Felix noticed Amy staring. What? he asked, looking down at his bowl. I always do this with cereal. It makes it more interesting and better tasting, too. He began stirring all the ingredients together with his spoon. Tess tried to hide her smile. Well, all I can say is that is quite a mixture you've got going there, Felix, at least in the chemical sense of the word. What do you mean? Matt asked. In chemistry, Tess replied, a mixture is made from two or more substances that are physically mixed together but can still be separated. You mean that I could pick out all the raisins, Felix said, plucking a raisin from the bowl and popping it in his mouth, and all the nuts and all the banana slices and cereal pieces and so forth. Tess nodded. And no matter how much you stirred the er, mixture in your cereal bowl, all the different types of matter wouldn't change. They would still have the same properties that they had before you mixed them together. Crystal had added a spoonful of sugar to her tea and was stirring it in. But mixing sugar into tea is different, right? Not really, Tess said. Because what you are making there is a solution, which is actually a special type of mixture. Solutions are formed when one substance is mixed into another and dissolves. It might look like the sugar disappears, but it really just turns into particles so small you can't see them in the liquid. But if sweet tea is a mixture, you should be able to separate the tea from the sugar and I don't see how you could do that, Matt said. Actually, you could, Tess replied. It wouldn't be as easy as picking raisins out of cereal. But if you let all the liquid evaporate, the sugar would be left behind as tiny crystals. That's like what happens when you go swimming in the ocean and don't rinse off afterwards, Daria added. The seawater evaporates, leaving little crystals of salt on your skin. Seawater is a solution that has lots of things dissolved in it, Tess agreed, but especially a lot of salt. Here comes Dr. Forrester, Julian said. Amy got the impression he had been waiting for her, and when she sat down, he asked again if she'd had any luck figuring out what kind of animal the small gully fossils had belonged to. Dr. Forrester shook her head, but she was smiling. The more I look at those little bones, though, the more excited I become. One of the three new pieces we found yesterday was especially interesting. From its shape and texture, I am quite sure it's from a small dinosaur. Amy shot a hard glance at Crystal, who started to shake her head, but then nodded and coughed softly. <clears throat> um, Dr. Forrester, she said, producing the sketchbook she'd been holding in her lap. I wanted to show you some drawings I made of the first little bones found in the gully. She flipped open to the drawings Amy had seen and turned the book around so Dr. Forrester and everyone else could see. These are very professional, Dr. Forrester exclaimed. Crystal, you've captured the details well. Thanks, Crystal said, embarrassed, but obviously pleased. But I wanted you to see them for another reason. You and Felix found six fossils that first day, not five, and my drawings prove it. Dr. Forrester studied Crystal's sketches for a long moment. 
So one of them is missing, she said softly. I'm hoping it will turn up, but until it does, I'd like to use your drawings, Crystal, when I study the fossils tonight. As they were packing up to head out to the dig site, Matt pulled Amy aside. So what do you think happened to the missing fossil? Have you uncovered any clues as to where it might be? I really have no idea, at least not yet. But it's not the only odd thing that's happened around here. She told her brother about Daria being gone for such a long time the previous night. Hmm, Matt mused. That does sound a little suspicious. Something strange happened in our tent last night, too. Felix has a huge backpack that's absolutely stuffed. Last night I was scooting it under his cot to make more room in the tent, and he said he didn't like anyone touching his things. And now this morning, Matt's voice fell to a whisper, there's a lock on it. Who puts a lock on a backpack? Someone with something to hide? Amy arched one eyebrow. But why would Felix steal a fossil? Matt smiled and mussed Amy's hair. When you figure that one out, let me know. It was day three of their paleontology adventure. Felix and Daria had removed nearly all the rock from around the cluster of backbones. Crystal and Julian were making good progress on excavating the bones of the dinosaur's foot. Amy could see that Matt would have the rock cleared away from his half of the jawbone by the end of the day. If she didn't work faster on her half, she'd be holding things up. Amy tried to put the mystery of the missing fossil out of her mind and concentrate on scraping and sweeping the crumbly rock away. Clues. Daria's strange behavior. Felix, the secret snacker. SUV. Tess and Dr. Forrester seem worried. Suspects. Daria, Felix, mysterious people in SUV. As more and more of the dark, gleaming fossil was revealed, Amy remembered something Tess had said when they first arrived at fossil camp. Tess, remember when I asked you what a fossil was? Ah, yes, so you did, Tess said, straightening up. Now that you all understand a little chemistry, I'll give you a more complete answer. Everyone put down their tools and stretched, happy for a break. Different kinds of fossils form in different ways, Tess began. But these dinosaur fossils formed as the original compounds in Achy Breaky's bones were replaced by other compounds, thanks to the powerful effects of a solution at work. Like sugar in tea, Crystal asked. In a way, Tess replied. When Achy Breaky died millions of years ago, his body was quickly covered beneath a thick layer of muddy sand. As a result, it didn't break down or decompose in the way most dead things usually do. It was preserved for a long time, sealed beneath tons of sand that gradually turned to rock. As time passed, water oozed down through the rock and picked up different mineral compounds along the way. These compounds dissolved in the water, creating a solution. As more and more minerals dissolved in the water, they began to come out of the solution as solids again. Little by little, those mineral compounds settled in tiny spaces in Aki's bones and teeth. They replaced his original compounds so that what was left at the end of this process were fossilized bones and teeth. And that's what you are excavating right now. You sure were right, Tess, said Felix, when you said that chemistry has a lot to do with paleontology. Amy went back to work thinking about the fossils in the rock beneath her hands in a very different way. They weren't just old bones, but the result of amazing changes in matter that had taken place over an incredibly long period of time. They were pieces of ancient history, very real clues to the past. 
Thinking about fossils in this new way made Amy glad she'd let Matt talk her into coming to fossil camp. Even if she didn't solve the mystery of the missing fossil, she was glad they were here. Hours later, they returned to camp, hot, sweaty, and tired. Tess warmed a big pot of water and set out a basin and towels. Does anyone want to clean up before dinner? She called out. Amy was first in line. Tess poured some warm water into the basin and handed her a bar of soap. As she washed her face and arms, the water in the basin turned cloudy and light brown, the same color as the sandstone ridges. There was a layer of sandy grit at the bottom of the basin. Wow, was I ever dirty, she said, patting her skin dry with a towel. Amy picked up the basin to toss away the dirty water and exclaimed, I created a mixture, didn't I? Tess nodded and laughed as she rinsed and refilled the basin for the next person in line. After dinner, everyone gathered in the lab. Dr. Forrester had laid out all eight of the fossil bones from the gully on a piece of cloth on the big table. Tonight, I want to show you how paleontologists help preserve fossils that are rather fragile, as these tiny bone fragments are. She held up a small brown glass bottle. This is a special solution, a sort of glue called a consolidant that we paint onto delicate fossils. Let me show you how it's done. A brush was built into the bottle's lid, and Dr. Forrester used it to carefully apply a thin coat of consolidant onto each of the fossils. She explained that the consolidant soaked deep into the fossils, and as it dried and hardened, it would make them stronger and less likely to break. These will be dry by morning. Then I'll go back to work analyzing them. If I could just find a matching edge for even just two of them, I might have a large enough piece to say for sure what type of dinosaur this is. She sighed and screwed the lid back on the bottle. We'll just have to wait and see.